Knecht, and I'm the executive director of the ECGI. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the ECGI new lecture that has been delivered by an outstanding ECGI researcher in the field of corporate governance annually since 2006. Um, today, it becomes the inaugural Wallenberg lecture, and it will be delivered by Oliver Hart, who is already with us, uh, and discussed by Anat Admati uh, of uh, Stanford, who is also uh, already here, and you might have, in fact, heard it already. Um, so let me briefly say a few words about the Wallenberg Foundations and why it is so um, fitting to have their name associated with this lecture series on corporate governance. I'll then say a few words about Oliver and provide an Amuse Bush introduction to the topic he'll be talking about. And I'll introduce a nut at the end of Oliver's lecture. So the Wallenberg Foundations are one of the largest funders of excellent researchers and research projects beneficial to Sweden, which associates them directly with ECGI's activities and purpose. Um, but there are other foundations with a similar remit, uh, but what makes the connection with ECGI special is how the Wallenberg Foundations invest their endowments. They're long-term investors and in companies and practice corporate governance responsible owners, not as absentee landlords. So as Luigi Zingales, Oliver's co-author asked recently, can foundations really separate how they invest their money from the way they spend it? And the same is true, of course, for university endowments, provided that your university has an endowment. The Wallenberg Foundations show how purpose in giving and investments can be combined, and it's a privilege that ECGI's annual lectures now carry the Wallenberg name. Now, turning to Oliver, uh, since he came to Stockholm in 2016 to receive this Veriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences and Memory of Alfred Nobel, or just the Nobel Prize in Economics, he does not really need an introduction in Sweden or anywhere else. Uh, but let me share two anecdotes uh, that will lead directly into the topic of his lecture. As you will hear shortly when Oliver starts to speak, he's originally from England and started his career at the London School of Economics, the LSE. Uh, then Margaret Thatcher came to power and he moved to MIT and then to Harvard. And if you deduce that the two events were not completely unrelated, you would be right. If you would deduce that Oliver has always cared about social responsibility, you'd be right again. So that was anecdote one. Now, the second one comes from a conference we organized at the University of Liberal Bruxelles to celebrate Grossman Hart at 20, referring to Oliver's seminal paper on vertical integration. In his introduction, Oliver recalled walking down the corridor when he was still at the LSE, when a colleague walked past and said, so Oliver, how does it feel to have one's feet firmly planted into the air? Now, that colleague clearly liked theorists. Then again, you probably know the joke when God, after inventing all jobs in the world, looked at the job of the professor and decided it's far too privileged. And as a remedy, after some reflection, he invented the colleague. Now, you are supposed to laugh, but I guess, you know, most people are on mute. Now, the flippant remark from the esteemed colleague was misguided at the time. But let me briefly show you why it is definitely wrong today. So could you show this slide? Is the slide up already? Elaine, could you show the slide? Yeah? Yeah. People can see the slide? We see it. Ah, great. Okay. So the graph I'm showing here comes from the Global Sustainability Investment Alliance 2018 annual report, an alliance of institutional investors Oliver and Luigi called uh, in their uh, previous 2017 paper, pro-social investors. The first thing the graph shows is that these investors manage trillions, not millions or billions of US dollars. The second thing it shows is that these investors clearly prefer exit. The tall red bar, the tall red box on the right, um, which is voice, is much larger than the smaller box on the left, which represents, sorry, the box on the right is um, exit and the smaller box on the left is voice. And clearly the large box is much, is much taller than the small box on the left. In terms of value, 20 trillion use negative and exclusive exclusionary screening 
while only half that number, 10 trillion US dollars, uh, engage in bringing about change. So exit in terms of what they do is much more important than voice. If you count ESG integration as a form of exit, the gap's even larger. The difference between these two types of responsible investing strategies is what Oliver will talk about tonight, and it is a multi-trillion dollar question. So Oliver, with this short introduction, um, thank you again for agreeing to deliver the inaugural Wallenberg Lecture, and the screen is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Marco. Um, now, how do I get my slides up, uh, Lane? Do I, um, okay, so do I... Share screen button at the bottom, the green button. Okay, just share screen, is that it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, and then... Um, Select the... Yeah, right. there we go. Perfect. Everyone see that? Okay, see thanks very much. It's, it's, it's an honour and a pleasure to give the Wallenberg Lecture, and I'm going to be talking about some joint work with uh, Eleonora Brocado and Luigi Zingales. Um, I, yeah, I, ho I hope I'm not going to impose too much math on you. I'll have to try to, I think uh, uh, Anat, uh, with her comments, uh, maybe we'll balance things uh, out I, uh, because there is a model here and I did want to give you some sense of it. But let me start off with some motivation. Although actually Marco has very, um, kindly provided a lot of motivation. Um, I think we all, with this audience, I don't really have to spend much time on the first slide. Um, we, you all know that companies are coming under increasing pressure uh, from stakeholders to pursue uh, ESG uh, goals. And there's also a growing academic literature that has argued that uh, the usual assumption in corporate finance that firms should maximize profit or market value um, is no longer valid in a world <clears throat> where um, there are government failures and, and externalities are important. And in specifically, and this is something that Luigi and I um, spelled out in our 2017 paper, the one that uh, Marco mentioned, um, shareholders may wish the firms that, that they own to pursue um, social goals if they themselves are socially responsible because firms may have a comparative advantage relative to individuals in doing this. And this is in a situation where government hasn't solved all the problems. And consumers and workers may also um, be willing to um, pay something for firms to act in a socially responsible way. Um, but then the question arises, well, how can these different groups um, bring about corporate change? You know, they want it, how do they bring it about? Um, in this paper, we argue they face two choices, and here we use the terminology of, of Hirschman, um, exit or voice. So exit refers to investors divesting from dirty companies. I'm going to use the example of pollution, but of course we all, you know, are more likely to be thinking about climate change, but I'll, I'll just talk about dirty companies. Um, investors can exit by divesting from, from dirty companies. Consumers can exit by refusing to buy the products of dirty companies. Um, workers can exit by refusing to work for dirty companies. I, the only reason that one is in parentheses is because it's not part of the model, but it's uh, similar to consumers refusing to buy uh, the product. Um, the alternative to exit is voice, um, which in this case uh, means investors engaging with management, for example, by voting. But, but more generally by pushing management to change their practices using, using governance mechanisms. And the paper is about which strategy is more effective. To give you a sense of the main findings, um, they are that uh, exit is less effective th than is often thought. That's what comes out of the model. And um, more subtle point, but maybe a more uh, important one really, is that private and social incentives to exit are not well aligned. Um, in contrast, voice is more effective than is often thought, and under re reasonable assumptions, private and social incentives are aligned. Um, now, there's a massive literature on this topic. I'm, let me just highlight two papers, uh, Henkel, Krauss, and Zechner's an early um, paper where they have a model which, and our, mo our model bears some 
similarities to theirs. And there's also a more recent paper by Pastor et al. Um, just to highlight some differences, um, in this paper, we endogenize the divestment boycotting decision uh, rather than just assuming a certain fraction people, of people do exit. And the other thing is our agents are consequentialists. So um, we don't assume that people have a taste uh, for ESG firms or a, dis, uh, you know, a taste for uh, clean firms or a distaste for dirty firms. Rather, uh, we're interested in people um, using one of these strategies to actually have an impact. So the basic idea is we want to know, um, is it worth your while to, to divest, say? Um, will the impact that you have be sufficient to make it a, a good decision for you? Um, now, in the analysis, um, it, it'll turn out that if, if people are purely self-interested, they would never engage in the kind of social action we're interested in. So in order to explain why people do any of these things, um, we assume that some people, uh, are, at least some people, are socially responsible, by which we mean that when they make a decision, they put a positive weight lambda on the well-being of others affected by the decision. So this is an important uh, element of the model. And just because it's important, let, let me give you an example. So uh, a very topical example, wearing a mask. Imagine that putting on a, a mask is not very pleasant. Um, it costs you 10 in terms of disutility. But, you know, you walk down the street or you're in a room and there's somebody else there. And by putting on this mask, you save them 50 euros of disutility, you know, from the chance of getting sick. So it's minus 10 for you, but plus 50 for them. So uh, the, the way you make the decision is you say, well, let's look at minus 10 plus 50 lambda. And if that's positive, I'll put on the mask. And or if it's negative, I won't. So obviously uh, it's all about is, la is your lambda bigger than a fifth? If it's bigger than a fifth, you're the kind of person who will wear a mask. If it's less than a fifth, you won't. Um, now, a subtle feature of the model, I'm just going to mention it but move on, is that we assume this doesn't affect your final utility. So this is a decision. This is, it affects your decision utility as to, you know, whether you put on the mask. But at the end of the day, if your land is bigger than a fifth and you put on the mask, your final utility is still minus 10. Okay, um, that's something which some people uh, have questioned, many have, but I actually quite like the assumption. But anyway, it's not crucial, I think, to what we're doing, but I just uh, flag it. Okay, let me jump into the model, um, because you do need a formal model, I think, to see how well exit works. Um, and this is the sort of simplest one we could come up with. It's a three-date uh, economy. Um, at date zero, firms are set up, production decisions are made at date one, and then production actually occurs at date two. Uh, there's going to be uncertain, some uncertainty. It's resolved at date two. And at that point, um, the, the um, good, there's going to be homogeneous, homogeneous good that firms are producing. That is sold on the market and consumers buy it. So there's a, the goods market happens at date two. Um, there are three groups in the model, um, entrepreneurs, investors, and consumers, and they're distinct groups. They don't overlap. Um, the entrepreneurs, these are the people who set up the firms at date zero. Um, they care only about money and have zero wealth. So they're just profit maximizers. Um, the, I, I mentioned they're all distinct groups. Now, um, the externality in this model is going to be pollution. Um, and this materializes, as it were, at date one. So this is a model where at date zero, people do not anticipate climate change or whatever it is. Uh, so it's not a rational expectations model, although uh, we do in the paper discuss uh, rational expectations equilibrium. It doesn't actually change things that much, but it does, you know, there are some changes. But I think this is fairly realistic that, that you know, when, when, the world starts, we don't realize the problems, uh, we, you know, any chance of them actually. And then suddenly at date one, we realize, gosh, they're serious. Um, so anyway, that's the setup. Um, we're going to be interested in a competitive free entry equilibrium. Um, okay, just going back to, uh, so I said the firms are set up by entrepreneurs at date zero. There's a setup cost F for each firm. 
each firm has a capacity constraint of one and a zero expected marginal cost up to that uh, one unit. Now, uh, expected marginal cost, the, the cost uh, is denoted by C, uh, although its expected value is zero, um, it has some variance. So we write C equals epsilon, um, and epsilon is an aggregate shock. It's normally distributed with mean zero and variance sigma squared. So that's the, the additional cost that you uh, incur at date two. Um, if you produce the unit, which you will because the expected value of that is zero. Um, and the uncertainty is only resolved at date two. The reason we have this uncertainty and it's an aggregate shock is because um, we want the limited risk tolerance of investors to matter. Um, and, and so we need some uncertainty. Um, now, there could also be an idiosyncratic component of the shock. And in fact, you should probably think there is because um, at some point we're going to, it's going to be important to assume that investors diversify their portfolios across firms, uh, which they wouldn't do if it was just an aggregate shock. Okay, the basic economy has one consumer, one investor, and then many potential entrepreneurs. That, of course, is not competitive. So in order to make it competitive, we replicate the economy. We just have our consumers, our investors. There's always an infinite number of uh, potential entrepreneurs. And, and in, <clears throat> in the competitive equilibrium, firms will, any firm that's set up at day zero will produce at full capacity, that is one unit, because the expected f additional costs are just zero. So, okay. Um, now here's the, um, let's go to date two and the equilibrium in the goods market. Um, here's the, you know, in the basic economy, as I said, there's just one consumer. Uh, this is uh, his utility function. Um, it's quadratic in, in the amount of uh, consumption Q, rho Q minus a half tau Q squared, and then constant marginal utility of money. So plus M, think of M as his uh, initial wealth. And then we subtract off the cost of the goods, which is P, the price uh, times the quantity Q. Um, that yields a linear demand curve, rho minus tau Q, P equals rho minus tau Q. And now we know what the supply is going to be. If N firms set up at date zero, and they each produce one unit, which they will under competition, perfect competition, then the total the you know, inelastic supply at date two uh, equal to N. And so, so um, substitute N into, uh, you know, Q equals N, and you get the, the price uh, that, we'll, that uh, we'll see at date two, rho minus tau N. Now, the, each firm's date two profit then, uh, they're producing one unit, they get P for it, but then they actually bear this cost epsilon. So they're their profit at date two is a RAM variable, P minus epsilon, uh, which is rho minus tau n minus epsilon. And it's the expected value of that is just rho minus tau n. That's the expected profit of each firm. Now we go to um, how, back to date zero, how does um, an entrepreneur finance um, the setup cost? So uh, any entrepreneur setting up a firm has to raise F euros and doesn't have any money of her own. So what the way she's gonna do it is she's gonna issue shares to investors. Now in the basic econ economy, there's just one investor, but in the replica economy, there'll be many. So um, the investor has this utility function, which is of course familiar to you, constant absolute risk aversion. Um, where, so that's what it is. Now normalize, so the inv investor's initial wealth is zero. And uh, suppose that, um, the alternative to buying shares is borrowing or lending at a zero riskless uh, interest rate. Um, okay, so now in a free entry equilibrium, the market value of each firm will be F because obviously if, if V, uh, the market value is bigger than F, then more entrepreneurs will um, set up firms, will enter the market because they can make money. Um, and if V is less than F, they wouldn't be able to finance the firms in, uh, at all. So V has to be F equal to F in equilibrium. So now let's look at the investors, um, 
date zero um, investment decision. So she says to herself, if I buy X firms, X is the number of firms I'm going to buy. So X equals one means I buy one firm. X equals 0.01 means I buy 1% of a firm. Um, I will be getting at date two X times pi tilde, right? Remember pi tilde was the, that's the random variable denoting the profit of a firm. I'll be getting that minus XF um, because I have to borrow, at, um, you know, my initial wealth is zero, but I have this exponential utility. I have to borrow um, XF euros in order to buy, because that's the, the, the price of each firm. So um, that will be my return at date two. Now the certainty equivalent of that, given uh, exponential utility and coefficient of absolute risk aversion equal to gamma, is you just take the mean, which is x times pi minus f, minus half gamma times the variance. Uh, you're all familiar with this. The variance is just x squared times the variance of pi tilde, but that's just the variance of epsilon, which is sigma squared. So we get that's the certainty equivalent, and you maximize that with respect to x, and that gives you the demand for um, firms, for shares, which is pi minus f over gamma sigma squared. So that's just a you know familiar formula. On the on the numerator, you have the uh, net, the expected return minus the cost, and on the bottom, you deflate it by the coefficient of absolute risk aversion times the variance. Um, now, so that's the demand for firms, because that, you know, remember, X is the number of firms you're buying um, by this single investor in the basic economy. And what's the supply of firms? It's just N. So market clearing at date zero in the stock market, in the share market, is demand pi minus F over gamma sigma squared has to equal N. But we know what pi is, pi is rho minus tau n. So we get um, that, and then we can solve that for n. So uh, n equals rho minus f, rho minus f gamma sigma squared plus tau. That is the competitive free entry um, number of firms, equilibrium number of firms that will arise at date zero in this situation where no one anticipates any um, pollution at date one. I haven't got to that yet. Now, okay, uh, as I said, this is a non-competitive economy as it stands, but to make it competitive, to make sure that price taking and all that makes sense, we replicate it. So in the replica economy, there are um, our investors with the preferences uh, of that single investor and our consumers with the preferences of the single consumer. And it's easy to see that the equilibrium number of firms uh, just expands uh, along with our NR where n is what we had before. Um, and okay, you don't have to keep track of that for most of the time, but there will be a moment where actually being in the replica economy is important. Um, now I want to assume, and the other thing I want, I want to highlight is that in the basic economy, there's only one investor. So in, in equilibrium, she's going to hold all n firms. She's gonna own 100% of all the n firms. In the replica economy, we're gonna have R investors and NR firms. And I want to assume that each investor holds one over R of each of the NR firms, which means in total, they are holding the equivalent of N firms, but they're fully diversified. And that can be justified by the idiosyncratic shocks, which are not modeled, but are in the background. Okay, now let's assume that at date one, we get a nasty surprise, climate change is upon us. And the way we model that is that we assume that with existing technology, which I'm going to now uh, call dirty, each firm produces harm H. And I'm going to suppose that this H is spread e evenly over the investors and consumers in the economy. So that each, there are two, there are investors and are consumers. So each one, uh, each agent, experiences harm by um, H over 2R. So it adds up to H. And I guess we've sort of left the entrepreneurs out of the picture. So somehow they've left this economy. They're not experiencing any harm. Lucky people. Um, a firm can avoid this harm by incurring an additional fixed cost delta at date one. Okay, so it, it can turn itself into a clean firm by paying a cost 
delta. Now we start off with um, a benevolent planner. What would she do? That's going to be a benchmark. So imagine you're a benevolent planner and you take over this economy at date one. Uh, of course, the number of firms that were set up at date zero is fixed. That's pre uh, predetermined. You can't change that. But what you can do is to decide how many of them become clean. Notice, and this is another sim thing that makes this model uh, simple to work with, the date two output market is unaffected by this choice because whether firms are clean or dirty, they're always going to produce at full capacity equal to one. So the total supply at date one will be N. And so the product market at date one will not be affected by any of this. Um, Okay, well then, uh, as a benevolent planner, what you would do is you would, you would choose the number of clean firms to maximize total surplus, which is investor surplus plus consumer surplus minus total pollution harm. And what you find, and this is in the paper, and we don't need to go through the gory details, it's very simple. Um, if H is bigger than delta, you want all the firms to become clean. And if H is less than delta, um, you want all of them to remain dirty. So you get a simple cutoff, a bang bang solution. And the, the intuition is very simple. If you're a planner, you know, if you make one firm clean, you incur a cost delta. That's a social cost to, you know, a cost to society. But the benefit to society is just H, because that's the amount by which the harm goes down. So, you know, it's not surprising that it's just all a matter of whether H is bigger than delta or less than delta. Okay, now we move to a situation where there is no planner, the government is out to lunch, and so um, we, we are looking at private action here, and we're going to consider three things, divestment, boycott, or engagement. So these are all private actions, um, and we're going to see how they work in the absence of any government doing anything. Um, now, um, as I mentioned, in order to explain any sort of social action, we have to assume that some people are socially responsible. And so what we, the way we model this is that we assume that a fraction pi of agents are socially, socially responsible in the sense that they have a positive lambda. Remember what lambda was in my mask example. It was, you know, it all depended on whether lambda was bigger than a fifth or less than a fifth. Well, a fraction pi of both investors and consumers, so for simplicity, it's the same fraction of each group, have a positive lambda, and the rest are purely selfish and have lambda equals zero. So we just make it simple by having a two-point distribution. Okay, we start off with divestment. So we analyze these things separately. Not, so we, we, we assume that um, we consider what happens if investors uh, announce they're going to divest, but um, there are no boycotts or engagement uh, happening at the same time. So imagine in particular that a fraction mu of investors announce at date one that they will hold only shares in clean firms. So imagine this is uh, visible. And so uh, think of it this way. We all go onto our websites or Facebook or Inst I, I don't even know how these technologies work since I don't do them, but you know. Uh, and we announce to the world, I announce to the world, I'm going to only hold shares in clean firms. And I'm going to, we assume this is a commitment, which is a pretty strong assumption, but we're, we're trying to give exit its best shot, divestment its best shot. So firms wake up at date one and they see how many people have announced that they're not uh, going to buy shares in dirty firms. And then they make their decision whether to become clean on the basis of that. Um, okay, and then, so we're gonna suppose there's a fraction mu, and then we're gonna ask whether these individual investors will want to announce they're going to divest. So this is not a coordinated campaign. Each person uh, makes um, their own decision, and it's got to be individually rational to sustain this as a Nash equilibrium. Now, the way the mechanism works is if the firms wake up and find that a lot of people uh, are divesting, then they realize that if they um, stay dirty, um, there'll be a small market for their shares. So people will be selling their shares at date one and, um, you know, getting out of dirty firms so that the 
uh, market value, their market value will fall. We, we assume that firms at date one are run by value maximizing managers. So there's some discussion in the paper of this. So they don't like the fact that the V, their value goes down. And they might realize, well, you know what, if we became clean, it's more expensive. So profits will be lower, but we'll suddenly find that there's, there's a bunch of people who are going to buy our shares. And so we might actually become more valuable if we become clean. That's the mechanism. So um, we study a divestment equilibrium, the, the new equilibrium. Now in an interior equilibrium, clean and dirty firms must sell for the same price because otherwise value maximizing managers would keep moving from one to the other. So, um, okay, so in the, if, they're, if both firms are present, they must be selling for the same value. So let me just briefly give you a sense of how the equilibrium works. Um, for the divestors, their demand for shares is given by that formula, pi minus delta minus V over gamma sigma squared. So it's basically the same formula as before. On the numerator, you have the profit, the expected profit, which is now pi minus delta, because the clean firms have to incur this extra cost, minus the price, which is V, which we haven't, we don't know what it is yet, but we can determine it, divided by gamma sigma squared. And since there's a fraction mu of them, um, we have to multiply that by mu to get the total demand. And then um, the supply is NC, where NC is the number of clean firms in equilibrium. And for dirty firms, we get ND equals one minus mu, because it's a fraction of the non-divestors, times, um, for them, it's just pi minus V over gamma sigma squared, because those firms don't um, incur the cost delta. Well, if you add and you use um, information about big N, which we got previously, and you, and you fiddle around a bit, you get a formula for e NC. The number of clean uh, firms in um, the divestment equilibrium is given by this formula. And it's a quadratic, mu n minus mu delta times one minus mu over gamma sigma squared. And we can observe some things about this. First of all, if big N is less than delta over gamma sigma squared, we're going to be at a corner solution for small mu, that the right-hand side will be negative, which of course means that we're not at an interior equilibrium at all, we're at a corner solution. Um, that's going to be the case, notice, if gamma or sigma squared are small, which makes a lot of sense because that's the case where um, when people divest, they find that actually the non-divestors are willing to take out the slack with a very small reduction in V because they're not that risk averse or the uh, risk isn't that great. So that's a case where you really have very little impact when um, you sell. Other people just are willing to buy your shares. Um, but let me, for the rest of the, time, of the talk, I'm going to focus on the case where we're not at a corner solution, in which case NC is positive. But even then, notice, and this is important, NC is less than mu n. Because of this uh, second term, the minus mu delta times y minus mu over gamma sigma squared, we find that divestment has a less than proportional effect. And it's again because non-divestors will pick up some of the slack, so V won't fall that much, and so firms don't have a strong incentive to become clean. And this is true regardless of lambda. Now then what we do, and I just uh, want to quickly give you a sense of this, but without you know, boring you too much, um, we're interested, as I say, we're, in this paper, we're modeling consequentialists. So um, the formula I got was under the assumption that a fraction mu divest. But we now want to ask, well, will they? We'd, will each person say, you know what? I, I prefer not to divest, even though I'm socially responsible. So in order to determine that, we have to look at the cost of divesting and the benefit of divesting. Now, to understand the cost of divesting, we, we just compare the payoff of a non-divestor with the payoff of a divestor. Now, a non-divestor, um, X naught is what they brought from date zero. So imagine that the first thing they do is they sell all their shares. Um, they'll sell them for V. And remember, they borrowed um, 
ex naughta f to buy them in the first place. So the second term is the sort of capital loss term. And then, then they buy x units, they sell, and then they buy x units, and they get x times pi tilde minus v. And for the divester, it's exactly the same, except they're only buying clean firms. So they get x times pi delta minus delta minus v because of that additional cost. Well, we can compute, compute the certainty equivalence of those two things and then look at the difference and we get a formula. And I won't bother you with the details, but there is obviously, um, there is some loss from in, to, in your certain equivalent from um, going and buying uh, clean firms, which sell at the same price at dirty firms, but uh, deliver less profit because of that minus delta. Now, what you do as a socially responsible investor is you compare that to the effect that not divesting has on other people. So if you decide, after all, not to become part of this fraction mu and, and to cease divesting, um, what's going to happen? Well, the number of clean firms will fall slightly. And that's going to have, you look at the effect on the environment of that, on other investors and on consumers, right? You, you care about everything, everybody but yourself, but weighted by lambda. So, it turns out that effects two and three are zero. Um, the impact on consumers is zero because as I mentioned, um, the product market date two, uh, date two doesn't depend on their, it's not affected if there are fewer clean firms. Um, the impact on other investors is zero by the magic of the envelope theorem, which says that that's all a second order effect because they're optimizing. Any small change in V doesn't affect them. So we're left with the impact on the environment. And in order to compute that, here we have to um, take seriously with the, that we're in the rep economy. So let me just, whoops, here we are. So currently, mu R investors have announced they're going to divest, you know, on Facebook. And there are NCR clean firms, right? Because everything's replicated. Um, if you stop divesting, there's one fewer divestor. So the number of divestors goes from mu R to mu R minus one which means the fraction changes from mu to mu minus one over r. So the change in mu as a result of your action is minus one over r. So we can now compute the change in the number of clean firms. The number of clean firms is nc times r. So what we do is we look at r times dnc by d mu times delta mu. But delta mu is minus one over r times r is minus one. So you just get minus dnc by d mu. Remember, this is the formula for nc. And so we can differentiate that. And what we end up getting is that your impact on the environment will be that. Because slightly fewer clean firms, which means slightly more dirty firms, and we multiply that by h, and that's what um, the impact of your uh, not divesting is. And we weight that by lambda, and we get then what we do, his star tells us the left hand side is your personal loss in terms of the reduced certainty equivalent um, you have from divesting. And you compare that to the social impact, which is the thing at the top, but multiplied by lambda. And so you will stay divested as long as that inequality holds. And you can mess around with it and you get that. And let me just say, because time is short, that it turns out that under reasonable, if we take the case which, where H is bigger than delta, so the planner would want all the firms to be clean, but where H is less than two delta, so it's between delta and two delta, so um, you know, po pollution is inefficient but not very inefficient, and if we also suppose that lambda is about a quarter, um, which is consistent with some experiments on how altruistic people are, then it turns out that um, this inequality is never satisfied, which means that the only equilibrium is mu equals zero, um, which is kind of disappointing. And of course, not consistent with the data. We do see people divesting. So something else is going on. But And um, you know, maybe layer lambda is higher, or there may be other reasons. But the other point I want to um, 
get you to take away from this is, you know, you look at that formula or that inequality and you realize, well, you know, H and Delta are in there, but it does not uh, correspond closely with whether H is bigger or less than Delta. So that um, sort of supports um, my earlier statement that the private and social incentives to divest uh, are not aligned because the social set incentive should be all about whether H is bigger than Delta or less than Delta. Okay, boycotting. I'm only going to say, you know, about 10 words about that because it's all in the paper. Um, it's very similar. It turns out the math is very similar. The mechanisms are very similar. When people boycott, they, you know, they announce they're no, not going to buy dirty product. It's assumed you can tell whether the stuff, even though it's a homogeneous good, whether it's coming from clean or dirty firms. And so you just announce you're only going to buy the stuff from clean firms, produced by clean firms. And the effect is that firms wake up and realize, well, if we stay dirty, we have a smaller market for our um, output. And so our profits go down. Whereas if we become clean, we have a new market from these boycotters. And so we can perhaps make more money. And so we again look at interior equilibrium where the profits have to be the, the, the market values are the same of the two types of firms. And we can compute uh, the formula and we find, okay, here's the formula for the number of clean firms where theta is the fraction of people boycotting. And it's very similar, it's a quadratic and you can get a less than proportionate response. Uh, private and uh, under some fairly reasonable assumptions, the equal, uh, equilibrium level of boycotting is zero, you know, given the impact versus the cost to you of doing it. And more generally, private and social incentives don't align. Okay, so now I want to go to engagement, um, which uh, it's the last thing, but maybe it's the most important because this is the thing which comes out better than the others. So um, let me uh, briefly explain what goes on with engagement. Um, unlike divesting and, boy and boycotting, um, engagement is not institution free. I mean, it all depends on how uh, things are set up. Um, and you know, in particular, how, uh, yes, how engagement translates into uh, actual impact. Um, now, what we do here is something very simple. We consider a vote. We imagine there's a vote um, on whether a firm should become clean. So assume that we're in uh, some situation where new N firms have decided to become clean. And now there's one other, uh, another firm which is debating. So we're at date one, right after we discover about a climate change and now um, the shareholders of this firm get together and vote on simple up down or up down or up or down vote on whether this firm should become clean. Now um, I'm just going to say this in words the math is in the paper but actually the words I think say it all. Um, imagine you're a voter you're a shareholder in this firm. Um, when you vote let's suppose you're socially responsible, you look at the effect on yourself, and then you look at the effect on everybody else. Now, the key thing is that, remember, I've assumed, and then this is now extremely important, that people are, are fully diversified. So you own one over R of this firm, and R, remember, is converging to infinity, so one over R is really small because um, you, you just own a little piece of many firms. Well, that's not very unrealistic, is it? Um, so it turns out if this firm becomes clean, its profits and market value will fall by delta because it incurs this additional cost. So you will experience a capital loss, but it'll be delta over R, which is negligible. So this part of it is actually going to, you know, just be canceled. It's going to, um, you're going to, it's, infinitesimal. You're going to ignore it. The impact on everybody else is not infinitesimal. Um, let's consider the, the different pieces in turn. First of all, you look at your fellow investors. Your fellow investors are in going to incur, in aggregate, the loss of delta, right? The other um, R minus one people investing in this firm will collectively pick up the capital gain of delta or delta minus delta over r because delta over r was your own little piece of it but in aggregate that's delta so you care about that so that's a minus delta 
the effect on consumers is zero because remember nothing, no um, change in the number of dirty versus clean firms has any effect on the date to product market. And then there's the impact on the environment, which is of course H. If this firm becomes clean, the total um, reduction in harm is H. So um, putting it all together, there's plus H, the impact on the environment, minus delta, the capital loss of your fellow investors. Um, and you, you weight that all by lambda. So we end up getting the conclusion that you will vote clean if lambda times H minus delta is bigger than zero. Again, because your own effect is vanishingly small. Um, well, it's a very simple, but it's rather striking conclusion because it turns out you end up voting just the way a benevolent planner would want you to vote. You know, if your lambda is positive, uh, so uh, this is a, a more general result. It doesn't matter whether your uh, lambda is, is big or small. As long as it's positive, you will vote clean if H is less than delta and you'll vote dirty if H is less, sorry, you'll vote clean if H is bigger than delta and you'll vote dirty of H is less than delta, just the way a planner would. So, um, okay, this is the sort of, um, this is our, supports what I said earlier, that engagement works surprisingly well uh, when people are fully diversified. Uh, of course, it wouldn't be true with large owners. If you had a large owner, then the uh, personal impact would, become, would, would start loom much larger and might outweigh any uh, social tendencies. Um, Marco, uh, how am I? I'm doing, I think, okay. Um, but what would you like? I have to of... Unmute myself. I think you have uh, another seven minutes. Oh, okay. Well, this is this is good uh, because let me. The rest of it is just some general comments. So, first of all, um, we know. I mean, what I did was very stylized. This idea of a vote, although it's you know certainly imaginable, but um, in practice, uh, certainly in the US, uh, maybe less so in Europe, putting up proposals for a vote is difficult and expensive. It's not going to be the interest of, 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 in the, of these uh, very atomistic investors, you know, hold hardly anything in the company to do it, to incur the cost of doing it. And management, uh, you know, we can't rely on them to take the lead. So in the paper, we talk about one a solution to this, which is to have mutual funds doing the job for people. So basically what would happen is you can imagine a green fund setting up and it announces we're going to be putting up climate proposals for votes. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's uh, we pledge to do that. And then um, if you like that idea, you can put your money with us. And we, uh, we show that that can work. That can uh, be a substitute for people um, doing it themselves. And of course, in practice, mutual funds can engage behind the scenes. And I think if you, we go back to Marco's original slide, um, some of that uh, engagement was happening not through votes, formal votes, but rather through um, conversations with, with management. Um, now, let me just, uh, yeah, some, some limitations. Um, our conclusion that exit may not work very well and that in fact for plausible um, parameter values you may actually get uh, people deciding not to bother at all. Um, that is obviously I think you know too strong because we do see people doing that. Um, I think our result that the takeaway result of the paper is as I said I think the two results are that exit may work less well than you think and it may work in the wrong way because private and social incentives are not aligned. Voice um, perhaps works much better than one might have expected. But here, some limitations. Um, we've taken social preferences as given. And in practice, you know, exit campaigns can catch fire. People or can be, they can inform other people about a problem. And then other people may choose to join in. So we, we gave the, we give the example of the Montgomery um, bus boycott in the mid 50s, which um, you know, brought to, to the, uh, Ameri you know, told Americans about 
um, the terrible things going on in the South. Or they should have been, of course, aware of them before, but many of them were not. And that just changed people's preferences and led to action. And um, as a, you know, perhaps a less important example, uh, the first free campaign by the Humane Society is not just the announcement of a boycott, but an, an attempt to shame fur users uh, so that, you know, if other people are boycotting fur and you um, appear in your fur coat, you know, people uh, look at you in a funny way and you don't want that to happen. So you end up behaving as if uh, you were socially responsible, even if you aren't. And so that can make exit be more powerful than in the model. And the other thing, of course, I don't want to, the paper is not saying that people shouldn't consider exit. It's <clears throat> perhaps saying more that they should consider voice as a uh, important alternative. But in practice, um, voice can be restricted in a way that exit can't, you know. So um, uh, in the US, there seem to be uh, many things standing in the way of voice and, and the um, regulatory authorities seem to want to um, make voice harder. Uh, so, you know, in the, in the US, uh, um, management can prevent proposals going up for a vote. And even if uh, proposals get a majority, as I'm sure you all know, um, they're not binding. Uh, and of course, sometimes voice is infeasible. Um, it, you know, Zuckerberg has control of Facebook, so voice, uh, at least the way we model it, is not going to work there. Or in the case of uh, the Koch, uh, Koch brothers, it's, uh, you know, Koch industry is private. They're private, so you can't exercise voice. Um, all right, let me just summarize and conclude then. Um, I think I have basically, uh, and, uh, so probably don't have to go through the three bullet points. Let me just end up with the fourth, the last one. Um, well, the, the third one. It seems like if you if you buy the results of the paper, then engagement should not be impeded. It should be made easier, not more difficult. And I've mentioned, you know, SEC policy um, seems to, um, you know, be about making it harder. And let me just flag a recent Department of Labor proposal, which is also going in that direction. So I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but there's this proposal that um, trustees of pension funds should be prohibited from taking any ESG factors into account in their investment decisions or voting decisions. That in fact, the idea is that they would be breaching their fiduciary duty if they look at anything other than financial return. Well, you know, according to this paper, that's just exactly the wrong thing, because um, I think our view would be fiduciary duty is acting loyally on behalf of the people have, who put their money with you. So uh, a pension fund, you know, we put our money into a pension fund. The trustee should be asking us what we want. If we're socially responsible, we might vote for a company to become clean. And so for the trustee to vote on behalf and say, oh, it's just financial return that matters, so I must vote dirty, it's just exactly um, the wrong thing. And yet that is what is being proposed right now. Okay, let me stop there. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Oliver, for once again, a super clear model and a super clear presentation uh, with a very clear prediction. Uh, you predict that uh, in fact, voice should be preferred to exit. But as I showed in the beginning, um, when you look at what socially responsible investors currently actually do, they practice more exit than voice. And I think it's an interesting question why that is. And certainly the fact that a voice is not institution free, as you call it, uh, is one potential candidate. But before we continue the discussion, let me turn to the discussant and present to briefly introduce her. Um, the discussant is Anatat Marty, and she is the George G. G. C. Parker Professor of Finance uh, and Economics at Stanford Graduate School of Business and a director of the Corporations and Society Institute. And I'll give you a little plug um, uh, here, Nat. Uh, you would really want to look at the website of the Institute that's doing... Uh, it's it's not an institute. Work. 
it's an initiative. Initiative, Inst initiative okay. <laughs> um, now I could go on for another 10 minutes uh, to describe what Anat, Anat has done and to important contributions also to financial stability and so forth. But, you know, let me just point why, just explain why she's so qualified to discuss Oliver's paper today. And that goes back to her really very influential uh, 2009 paper with Paul Fleider, which was published in the RFS called The Wall Street Walk and Shareholder Activism. And it was the first finance paper to point out that in fact, exit can be used as a form of voice. So Anat, with this little introduction, uh, over thank to you. you. And thank you again for agreeing to come and discuss Oliver's paper at a very early hour in the morning uh, in Stanford. Yeah. Thank you. Well, when I saw the title, it was exactly like, I want to read a paper on exit and voice. I wrote about this, but as I'll put that, our paper and this paper in context. So thank you very much for inviting me and hello everybody. Uh, I'm going to fly through a lot of slides here. Uh, so this paper, uh, and I'm going to skip some of the, I'm going to skip all the math because Oliver did that and I'll just give you the bottom line very quickly because I want to put the paper in perspective. This paper takes seriously that governments may fail to address externalities and try to understand um, the authors try to understand the workings of stakeholders' activism, okay? They depart from the standard focus and assumptions of the academic corporate governance literature, which I will explain in law and finance, which is shareholder focused, uh, analyzes specific form of activism fall under this shorthand of exit and voice as terms that Hirschman used more very broadly about institutions, about uh, including, uh, including governments, and uh, I'll go there too. Previous exit versus voices papers such as ours um, and the ones that followed um, focus on the standard shareholder manager conflict and therefore a, a large shareholder and could they threaten to leave and what would that do? Is it credible? All of that. So that's what we studied in that paper voice. It should be. Uh, um, so this paper is very important and very timely. Uh, and what I will do in my discussion is I'll provide perspective on the model just on the outset, which uh, Oliver tried to do at the end. So I'll pick up right where he left. And then I'll take this approach to its logical conclusion. And you'll see what I mean by that. So very quickly, all of you here that are doing corporate governance know what corporations are. Uh, they are abstract legal entities. They're separate from all stakeholders. They're created in the U.S. under state law, uh, other countries under other laws, governed by the laws, the charter that they have, and controlled by directors and officers. Their rights in the law are derived from governments and legal systems. They, they definitely always have property rights, locked shareholder funds. In other words, the shareholders actually can't get their funds. They need the, the board to decide to give them a dividend or something. They might be able to sell them, might be able to sell them in the market or not. Uh, in the US, they get political speech rights, they get religious rights. Uh, but what's important about the corporation and why what gave the corporation its winning form in the economy is this complete separation between the co corporation as a legal entity and everybody else, including shareholders, okay? So I, I put it as a corporate veil, which is sometimes in the law, they talk about piercing, okay? So here's the corporation, there are some people working there, and here are all the stakeholders, and I put them together in maybe groups in this paper, maybe they overlap, but somebody wears multiple hats, but, um, they, they are there and they have to pierce the veil to get through to the corporation and whoever manages it. So there are people that by now you're really talking about a broader governance problem. And the question is how big is this, how thick and how penetrable this veil is? How can you enter and impact it? Who can do that? Can even the law do that? Can you even know that and impact what happens behind, you know, in those headquarters? Do you even know what's going on? So the standard view of government, of governance and what the, the corporate finance textbooks will literally use is that corporations are owned like a set of assets, which is wrong, technically and importantly so. They're not owned by shareholders. The main governance challenge that, a challenge that we, I spent a lot of time in, then everybody spent a lot of time in, that you know, for decades now we've spent all our time on, is that manager-shareholder conflict, if such exists, in private companies maybe less. And the way we solve it is by giving stock-based compensation, for example. Uh, maybe accounting profit, return on equity, people have been discussing this for a while. 
Now, I want to frame here governance. This is your, your big thing, okay? So I want to frame governance for all institutions, whoever it is, corporations in the private sector, in the government sector, who makes decisions, what information or constraints do they have and should they have, if you're asking a policy question or a design question, what are or should be their motivations, their incentives, how do you give them the right incentives, what's the contract, what's the agency problem, and then is the outcome somehow socially efficient. So, you know, does it correspond to some benevolent social planner or whatever. So big words around governance that are important, power, information, incentives, okay. Now the key to effective governance would be trust, some way we can trust, some way to commit, uh, and some accountability. So there's all these things have to be put into, uh, into real things. So the question is, how do they come about? How does it come about that you trust somebody? How, do you, uh, how does somebody make a commitment? How is somebody accountable? Who holds them accountable? Those are the real questions of governance in the broadest way. So commitment is always difficult and talk is always cheap. So how do you commit? This is a little bit of an issue in the paper uh, because they do as assume commitment and talk is cheap. And this is sort of the social, the climate, the political climate that Oliver starts with, which is this business roundtable decisions. They care about everybody. Okay, that's a talk is cheap thing. Okay, we share a fundamental commitment to all our stakeholders and they commit to all these stakeholders and shareholders are at the end. Each of our stakeholders is essential. We commit to deliver value to all of them for all the future success of our companies, our communities, and our country. So this is a year ago generated a lot of uh, a lot of these are the pictures of some of them. You can see they came from Boeing, KPMG, Amazon. You know, obviously BlackRock and Jamie Dimon was at the top of it, and there's a Bank of America CEO. So 181 CEOs. Okay, Davos last year, this year, sorry, had a manifesto. The universal purpose of a company in the fourth industrial resolution, the purpose of a company is to engage all its shareholders in shared and sustained value creation. That's what they say. This is right there in the first sentence. So what does that mean? Well, you know, many of us have been saying cheap talk and there've been articles in the media recently about, you know, the same companies and how they behave under COVID and all this stuff. Okay. So that was talk. They didn't put any teeth to it. They didn't make any commitment that, you know, we're going to put them, you know, shoot them if they don't do it or whatever. Okay. There was no way they actually are committed to it. People say stuff and get away with saying it. They get a headline. Larry Fink got a headline. What does he actually do? You know, that's the question. So rules and contracts attempt to create commitments. Now, the rules can be created in the private sector or in the government, okay? The government writes laws, regulations, treaties, acts, depending on, on the context, okay? Governments, plural. And private sector write all kinds of laws. I mean, you know, my students are complaining about, you know, Stanford Compact, where they have to do this or this or this. We make them sign stuff. Every time you sign on an app, you have to accept all kinds of terms of service um, that are, you're not really negotiating, but, you know, licensing. You know, there are contracts and there are just statements and charters and, and, and honor codes and, and policies and bylaws and all of that. Okay, so those are ways to say, here's what I'm going to do. Here's how I'm going to handle it, you know, and then, you know, you could change it later. So that's a commitment problem, uh, but, but, but that's the sort of the institutional structure that we somehow assume in our model, that there are rules of the game. And then, you know, they come under many names. Even computer code is basically, you know, a set of rules, basically, for how the computer is going to do something. And Larry Lessig said this back in 99. Okay, now we're arguing. it. And all rules, even constitutions, which is kind of our biggest, most solid, solemn commitment being discussed right now in the Senate with a nominee, it requires interpretation. What does it mean? You know, did it give you this right? Is you, are you doing it under the constitution or not? And we'll come back to that. They all need adjudication. Somebody has to decide what the words mean and enforcement, okay? On enforcement, they're useless without enforcement. These rules will completely changed the way we get around them. Okay, so that captures, you know, regulatory arbitrage, what we would call or whatever, okay? So, uh, so the standard approach to governance assumes that shareholders agree, uh, the corporations should focus on maximizing stock price, markets are competitive, contracts and the rules of society, and of course competition, protect everybody, employees, consumers, creditors, the public. It is beautiful logic. We just left with their shareholders and that's it. The rest of it works out. So nobody else needs to be considered. 
That's an assumption of those models. The Milton Friedman thing is the rulers of society. He says, obey them. But, you know, the assumption is that the government works. Never mind that he later goes on to bash governments and all of that, which has created this hostility to government that we're watching today. It ignores the shareholders' true preference. So I'm getting to this paper. It ignores the potential failure of governments to provide sufficient protection to stakeholders. And that's sort of where this paper comes. Hardened co-authors rightly recognize that all of this set of assumptions, they do maintain the competitiveness somehow and don't explain why that comes about, but they do maintain that. Uh, but this approach is blind to reality. And so they actually look out the window and say, well, maybe this is not the right approach. Maybe companies, uh, uh, maybe governments fail. Maybe shareholders' true preferences are not to maximize stock price. So maybe the whole edifice is wrong maybe, and they go and start exploring this, which I want to celebrate, okay, even as I'm going to question some of the things. So the two mechanisms that they uh, examine, I don't know if these are good pictures, but that's what I could find yesterday, um, exit and voice. So shareholder exit divestment, shareholder voice vote, and uh, customer exit. You could sometimes have employee exit, you know, things like that, okay? So that's, uh, that's the, the, the commitment. So what is it they do? They assume, so I'm, this one I'm gonna fly through because Oliver did this, uh, you know, with the math, a fraction of distinct shareholders and customers. They're each a distinct group. They're not overlapping. Uh, they do everything one at a time, are socially responsible. Product markets are competitive. Shareholders are diversified. Entrepreneurs have zero wealth and are selfish. Everyone agrees about the social cost and benefits, so social welfare function is clear. So you don't have any kind of collective action problem in this model. Governments do not impact the corporation's decisions because of some political failure they allude to, uh, but divestment, boycott, or shareholders might impact, okay? So that's the setting of this paper. And what is considered is these uh, three ways. The scenarios are unanticipated when the corporation is formed, analyzed separately, and stakeholders' decisions are endogenized, which is obviously very good for a model. It's an ambitious model. It's an interesting model. It's a thought-provoking results that resonate in some respect, but not in other respects. So I'll talk about that. The results are basically divestment may occur, et cetera. I give the, his bottom line. Exit is less efficient. This is in his words. Exit is less efficient than is often thought. Voice is more effective than is often thought. That is how Oliver summarized the results at the end. Uh, and what I want to question now is the, fo the following. First of all, does the model of exit and, and this is what they actually point out in later section, and Oliver alluded to that in the limitation discussion. Um, does it capture when and how boycotts and divestments can actually work, or does it exclude how they actually work, okay? Which basically uh, Oliver said. In the model, everyone's preferences are fixed. As he said, there are no information asymmetries across stakeholders. Corporate actions are observable, so I'll get back to that. And shareholders or customers are able to commit to exit Okay, again, they comment on that. This is only realistic for some large or well-known investors or customers such as celebrity institutions or large corporations, endowments, maybe, you know, they, they say that they can go back on it, who checks on them, I don't know, but, but anyway, uh, they assume commitment, okay? That's the only way it's gonna work in this model, okay? So that's the way they generate exit at all working, okay, in this model. But, and exit impacts the profits, this is the mechanism somehow profit or share price. So that's the way mathematically this is gonna work. But as they cite, and as is true, boycotts and divestments work less through prices and there's evidence that they don't really have a lot of impact. Somebody walks in and invests, all of that, that was noted about the initial stage. Uh, and they work better when they inform others and exert reputational costs on the company or some political, I'll, talk, I'll get to politics in a second. And these are all mechanisms outside the model. So, so exit doesn't look good, but it's because it was kind of rigged not to look good the way it was excluding how it can work, okay? So that's, that's just in the model and we're stepping out of the model, which I appreciate is you know, a, a cheap talk, but we do have to step back and ask, okay? Now let's ask about voice. Does the model of voice capture when and how shareholder voting actually works? And I, I, Oliver again alluded to that. Uh, in the model, diversified shareholders vote as if they're pivotal, and majority of shareholder vote determines the action, dirty or clean. Voting achieves the optimal outcome, the efficient outcome if a majority of shareholders are uh, socially responsible and maybe shareholders can use intermediaries uh, to, to achieve the thing because they note uh, in the outset that there might be costs. But 
shareholders rarely get vote on business decisions. So there are numerous decisions that don't come for a vote at all. And so the, the mechanism of, of voice, which Oliver noted is a, an institutional thing, you know, may or may not come and proxy voting is only advisory. So noted as well, okay. But I wanna make another point, which also uh, Oliver made, Corporations have ways to suppress voting. We're now in election season and voter suppression is a big topic in the news right now. And so this is a picture about the voter suppression. So going private, uh, you know, taking the majority like, Mark, like uh, Zuckerberg does in Facebook, uh, shuts the, voice, the voices so that, you know, you can't do anything to Facebook. You can put political pressure on it. You can submit some letter. You can force somebody else to do something. So as they know, for voting to work, the rules must allow it to have impact. So we're back to rules. We're back to rules. Now, the example that uh, Oliver gave um, which, uh, you know, neither Oliver nor I are U.S. citizens, and this was happening around the time I was born, so... Uh, I'm a U.S. citizen. Oh, I'm a citizen. No, 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 we didn't, we are neutralized citizens, right? I mean, both of us. <laughs> well, I am a citizen right now. I, I do vote. I, I will vote this election. Not at the time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Not at the time. I, then I was born not here, and I was not a citizen then. So, but I read up about it because they gave the example and I heard about it. Now, was this a boycott of the bus company? Was this the kind of exit that they are talking about? The customers are not uh, buying the tickets? It was, but it wasn't about the bus company because in fact, segregation in Montgomery, Alabama was mandated by city ordinance. The bus company would have to violate local laws to allow the blacks to sit in the front. So this was not about the corporation at all. The corporation would have had to, to violate local laws to, 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 uh, to respond to this strike. And it lost money, by the way. So in other words, the government failed to do the socially right thing. And, they, and that's who they were directing it. And eventually it was the courts that did that. The courts ultimately said that the, um, this uh, uh, law was violated the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Do you remember that from your tests, Oliver? Uh, yeah. <laughs> 14th yeah. Amendment. And, uh, and, and uh, because of that, all, to, all the way to the Supreme Court, that uh, strike succeeded. A year worth of a strike. They walked. They, they did not go on the bus, okay? the black people, and they were the majority of the population there, and the bus company couldn't do anything, even if it was very socially conscious. So, it, you know, it wasn't the type of example of corporate state of stakeholder activism in a corporate context. It was political activism in a governance context. It was just done through boycotting that corporation. And in fact, some of the other campaigns you're talking about, I mean, maybe who they are directed to, Nike or the, comp or the countries that have cheap uh, child labor or whatever. So who are we actually, you know, trying to have a voice with? What is it about? So let's talk about it. The investment boycott and, and a voice, and I was in a Stanford Investor Responsibility Committee, so I was interested in the governance as exercised by my own endowment. We do have an endowment, Marco, it's $25 billion, and it's a debate now about what we should do with it and COVID. Uh, uh, there are political statements, and I knew this when I was there and we were asked to divest from private prisons. Okay, so, so they, I've seen these things in the context of an institutional investor who's a, it was a nonprofit like the Wallenberg. Okay, I mean, we're an academic institution, we're at some trust. Good governments, the benevolent dictators should act to address social injury. So whenever we're saying we're gonna vote this way, we're gonna divest, we're gonna uh, boycott, we're gonna do this, somewhere in there, the government is failing. Because if it was serious social injuries, the government should do something about this. So again, this was a starting point of the paper that the government is failing. But my question is, well, what about that? What are we gonna do about that? In our mind and in our models, the government is sort of taken as exogenous and the government is not our problem because we're not political scientists, because we don't look at political economy. It's not our problem, okay? We, the market are, you know, in the Chicago tradition where Luigi comes from, markets are wonderful in Milton Friedman's and free markets, you know, are wonderful and governments are terrible and awful, okay? 
And that's an attitude by the Koch brothers and other people, okay? And if you read Michael Lewis, it's a terrible attitude. Competent government is critical. Even if you privatize essential services, somebody's got to write these rules with the ambulance company or with the, with the prison company or whatever. So it's not even about who does what. It's about how do we get it to work, okay? That's really what it's about. Who writes and enforces the rules for, uh, of the game, not tame, for markets, corporations, and people? So corporations and legal people, remember, you know, who writes the laws for every person, legal person, okay? And how do they enforce it on these legal people, okay? That's what I'm interested in right now. If governments are incompetent or corrupted, why is that? And what can we do? Because we can't say the government exists in some other sphere. Indeed, Oliver finished by talking about, you know, the government. How can we help make the government work? Do we have a voice? Is exit an option? In Hirschman's world, there was immigration. We could leave. We'll all go to New Zealand or something. You know, <laughs> how are we going to get the government to do what we want? I mean, that's the big challenge. That is the big challenge, okay? So now I'm replacing the corporation with the government. What are the legal shields the government has from us? You know, the Constitution makes us able to impeach a president or, you know, what is it that's going to make the government work? What is going to make democracy work? Okay, in democracies, if not democracies, we don't have a voice. You know, we're in China, we're in autocratic regimes, and we don't have a voice, okay? In a democracy, we're supposed to have a voice, okay? So I'm using the same diagram, but putting the government there and the rest of us on the other side, okay, who are impacted by the government, and all of us are. So I'm going to flash a few things, and I got to run. Uh, you know, and, and these are really, really awful things, okay? An opioid manufacturer, um, you know, bribing doctors, pharmacies distributing just like drug dealers. I will post this. My own utility, which is not going to cut my, my services if it's hot, you know, which I don't, I can't exit because otherwise I couldn't talk to you right now. Uh, has admitted to 84 manslaughters and avoided 90 years in jail because it's a legal person and not a, and not a natural person, so it can't sit in jail. Nobody went to jail for killing people. Volkswagen defrauded. Luigi Zingales, in his presidential address, talked a lot, had no model, talked a lot about financial fraud and how we're ignoring it usually because it's some few bad apples somewhere, okay? And we cheer on the financial sector, okay? So, do we even know what's going on? This is looking under the light. Did you lose your keys here? No, but that's the light. I'm looking for it over there. We don't know what's happening in private companies. Do, do corporations have enough, too much privacy? They work in the shadows and shell companies and we don't even know who they are. So that's not the private companies we study. Do we know? They move money around the globe. So Oliver Hart's motivation slide said, as a result of political failure, you know, externalities are not well controlled. I'm quoting. His final remarks are, you know, policy implications. Okay, so that's where he ended. Department of Justice, SEC. Sure enough, I was reminded by Oliver himself that a few of us try to have a voice with the SEC. A few of us wrote a letter and we got 60 people to sign it. And I think it was, signed, it was sent to your group to sign uh, that uh, we're protesting this, uh, this, uh, this rule about proxy advisors, that it would uh, impede voice, okay? And the Department of, Law of Justice impedes voice, okay? I spoke to Bloomberg about what, they had, what the mutual funds can do, the big three index funds. Start with do no harm. Can you do something about that, Mr. Uh, uh, Larry Fink, you know, start with the basics, okay? This is a quote from me at the end of this article about the hidden dangers of the index fund takeover, okay? I'm going to end by the following. Are we part of the problem? I think being blind is part of the problem. When I got into banking, which is where I spent the last 10 years not writing these models that would come maybe before you sometime, uh, I met somebody who left the PhD program and um, and said to me at some point, with such friends as academics, who needs lobbyists? Now, I found that very chilling, okay? And I can elaborate to you in, later on the context in which he said that, okay? He works for one of the major, major institutions that you've heard about. And uh, I wrote a paper about that, about it takes a village and all the enablers, okay? So all wrongdoings are enabled by people who stand by. Are we standing by or are we looking at reality? In a recent paper, uh, it, it, I published two things in the pro market, the Stigler blog, where Luigi um, has his initiative, uh, sort of uh, the, the richer version of my initiative at Stanford, which has more volunteer students and faculty, uh, that has a list of topics to be studied. Let's study whistleblowers. Let's study all these things that we don't study. And 
Last week, a couple of weeks ago, I published this one about justice. And this goes through uh, basic justice in a corporate context, okay? And being blind to how far we are from the world of Milton Friedman is among the reasons both capitalism and democracy appear to experience. But what I say in the, is voice. Neither corporate managers nor government leaders are likely to act in society's interest unless stakeholders express their wishes and take actions to hold power to account. So what I'm saying is the governance problems of governments and corporations are intertwined. They, they fail or succeed together, okay? So I wanna broaden this. We must ex exert whatever influence we can as shareholders, customers. So this is a civic action to all of us, including in our academic jobs, okay? For democracy and corporate governance to deliver socially optimal outcomes, everybody's voice is different. So the summary is I'm thrilled to see the serious effort to move away for the terrible assumptions uh, of standard corporate governance. So thank you for that. With this paper and others, I want to open the floodgates to enrich and deepen our understanding of the complex issues around governance, including corporate governance. Corporate governance intertwined with government of, uh, governance of government. And thank you for engaging. Sorry, I was rushed, but I was thinking about this and decided I was going to put it all together. Thank you very much, Onat. So, Oliver, do you want to quickly respond before we turn to Q and A? Well, um, I, you know, I think Onat raises some very good points, and I, I, I agree with you know what the, the what she was saying at the end or, uh, about government. That yes. Um, it's very important that we, we don't just put that to one side. I think what we're, what we're saying here is that um, corporations can be part of the solution, you know, in, in contrast to the sort of Friedman view um, that uh, companies should, just, you know, can just get on with maximizing profit and then all the social stuff, the externalities, externalities can be... Um, uh, dealt with by government, you know, which was a very sort of would be great if it worked, but it doesn't work. And here we're saying, well, let's suppose government fails, you know, completely, then how can companies um, improve things to be a bit of a substitute for government? But of course, uh, and that is right, uh, at the end of it, we have to bring them together. And, and we have to also ask, and we should be asking how uh, we can improve government. I, I think I see all the players as uh, important for making the world a better place, individuals, companies, and government. That's right. And, uh, you know, we have to work on all three fronts. Yeah. But it certainly is the case that, um, uh, you know, we, and I, I think she's right, exit doesn't really, if I understood her correctly, I mean, it doesn't really work with government because, you know, yeah. leaving the country is just too big, a, uh, the costs are too great for almost everybody. And so, um, you know, voice is the thing, is the only thing we've got there. And um, um, as economists, we, we should be spending more time thinking about that. So I, I think that's a very important point. Thank you. I'm teaching a course called Finance Corporations and Society to a lot of Stanford undergrads. So I'm gonna switch my screen to them and uh, see them instead of you in front of me. Thank you very much. I hope you'll Thank send you me much your, on that. your slide. I went through them fast, but I can post them on my website or I can send you, Marco. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So the first question comes from Jill, Jill Fish. So Jill, I think uh, we can unmute you. Um, hi. So um, thank you, Oliver, for the presentation. And I wondered if you could just talk a little bit more about how your model addresses the potential divergence of interest between the money managers of these funds and the people who invest in the funds. At the very end of your remarks, you were talking about the possibility that investors would prefer green investing, but money managers would be voting to maximize profits. And I think what the DOL is worried about is the reverse situation. People like Larry Fink, who actually don't have the economic stake, are voting green or advocating that funds do things that might um, decrease, you know, profits to shareholders. And the, you know, retirees who have their money in the funds might not want that outcome. Yes. Well, I think um, our view is that that people like Larry Fink should go back to their investors and find out what they want. So yeah, when you 
hear him talking about the importance of companies becoming more socially responsible and how he's going to vote this way or that way or engage this way or that way. It, it, it does sound as very much as if it's his decision, but it shouldn't be, you know, it should be um, the decision of the people who uh, in, entrust him with their money. Um, so that, you know, exactly how that, so it, it's very similar to the companies finding out from their shareholders what they want. Similarly, the fund managers should find out from their investors what they want. Um, one can imagine a situation, and I was sort of alluding to this with the Green Fund, that um, these funds say ahead of time, this is what we're going to be pushing for. And then the investors will choose, you know, BlackRock or Vanguard or Fidelity or whoever, whichever um, fund, um, appeals to them in terms of, of, you know, what they're going to be doing. So that would be another way where instead of asking them, you, you, you tell them and then you say it's up to you whether you invest with us. Yeah, and I think to some extent the, the beneficiaries, so the trustees of pension funds when they hire an asset manager already do that. I mean, they, when they give a mandate to an asset manager, it often comes with instructions. But of course, for retail investors, that's not true. So I think we have the next question is actually from an anonymous attendee. So I'll read it. Uh, how do you think that the exit boycott model can be put in a regulatory governance context? Any suggestions? Not sure. I'll read it again. Okay. How do you think that yeah, yeah, the exit I got it, boycott? I'm not oh, okay. sure I quite understand it. Um, I mean, one of the things. Well, it's about a written question. I can't. I can't improve. So, ah, we have now more votes for another question. Okay, some from Maria uh, Grigoropoulou. Um, so I'll read it. What about when environmental preferences conflict with other social preferences? i.e. employee layoffs? Um, does that mean that you're voting on something which is going to be good for the environment or bad for employees? Or does it mean that, um, I mean, it can certainly be uh, that, you know, I, you and I might agree about the environment and we might disagree about employees. So, um, I think when, when we talk about funds with different um, um, agendas, you know, saying they, um, I mean, in the extreme, you could have a fund that says, you know, we are, um, we care about the environment. Um, we care about gun control. We're anti-abortion. Or there could be another fund which says we, you know, we're pro-abortion, you know, we, we, we're pro-choice. Um, and we will, uh, so of course we know that people, um, you know, they can agree about some things and disagree about others. So you can have, uh, at the extreme, you could have people just selecting a fund which, which has exactly their preferences, but probably that, you know, we're not gonna uh, be in that world. So some compromises will have to be made um, and you may end up voting. I mean, just as if you had a vote um, in the model, you know, you could have a vote on clean versus dirty and you could have a vote, another vote on whether this company should sell uh, an abortion pill. And maybe, um, you know, the, the clean people would be in the majority on one and, the, and, and it would be a different group in the majority on the other. And that's just the way it is, as with um, dem democracy. Um, I think what we're saying is companies, or we should think of companies as, as being, you know, it's more like the political sphere. So Oliver, I'm now told by the, the authorities uh, at ECGI that uh, we've run out of time. So let me uh, just thank you again uh, for delivering the lecture and to just stress uh, what important a topic it is. And I think we've seen that there are many more things to discuss that the model does not yet capture. For example, we haven't talked about boards. Uh, we have talked, started to talk about 
the institutions that you actually need in order to exercise voice. So I can just see a whole series of seminars coming out of the model and you know, the, the discussion that you started today. So thank you very much again um, for your, also your support for ECGI uh, and for delivering the first uh, inaugural Wallenberg lecture. Uh, and it, it, it's been fascinating as always. Well, so well thank, thank you. you very much, Mark. I just say, I mean, this is a, this model is a kind of first step. I think we want to, I think it is it's such an important topic and we want to get, you know, some serious analysis. It's not, there's a literature already, but I think there's so much more to be done. So that's uh, the way I think of this, but thanks a lot. I'm sorry that we can't interact in person because one, you know, that is always better, but you know, this is uh, vaccine is on the way. We just don't know yet when. <laughs> right. <laughs>